interesting group for artificial intelligence times humanity panel. Uh, I would like to do a very short introduction because this group of people already, just before we got started, got hot in an interesting discussion. So we just keep going. So um, Adam Harvey is here from Berlin, and his work is focused on computer vision, privacy, and surveillance. Uh, Nai is uh, with us from London. She creates software systems that explore technology paradigms and underlying power dynamics and machine gaze. And then we're honored to have Rasha Rahim here with us. She's a deputy director of Amnesty Tech uh, and at the International Secretary of Amnesty International, also in London. And there she heads up the AI and big data team whose work focuses on challenging the systemic threat of hum to human rights that's posed by surveillance-based model of big tech companies. So clearly there's a, a center interest concern about human rights and surveillance and what that means in our society right now, especially under the circumstances we have where our health and well-being are actually in question and how do we work with policymakers and those who are decision makers, for instance, in this country that with so many denials going on um, and then using surveillance uh, technologies in the midst of this. So with that, I would like to just uh, have one of you start. Uh, do you want me to call you out or do you want to just go for it? <laughs> I, I'll call you up. Oh. All right. So I will actually start with Adam uh, because uh, the work you're doing right now is quite interesting and it overlaps with the other two speakers. So maybe you can say a little bit about what you're involved with now and what's keeping you busy. Thanks for the intro. And thanks for, for joining in. So what's keeping me busy Lately is two projects that I'm working on. Um, one of them is called Megapixels, and the other one is called VFrame. Um, in terms of human rights, I think they're both probably relevant to this discussion. Uh, probably talk more about VFrame tonight and how the well the idea is to take some of these technologies that have been developed by police forces or militaries, and then you know, think about how they can be reappropriated in the human rights space. So that's really where the idea came from for VFrame. Um, so VFrame is a project where I develop customized computer vision algorithms that are um, specific to the application in, for example, Syria or Yemen or Sudan. And what that means more specifically is when you see AI on the internet, it takes on a very consumer-driven uh, personality. And I think what everyone on this panel wants to see and, and wants to hear about is how can AI be applied towards more, whether it's human rights or just a perspective that keeps humanity more in mind. Um, for example, if you look at the availability of computer vision products and what they can detect, uh, what they can recognize and the way they see the world, the way they see the world is largely driven by national security interests or police forces. So, of course, we have a lot of uh, thousands of research papers coming out every year about new ways to improve face recognition. But the there's not one single algorithm that anyone else has developed to recognize, for example, cluster munitions in Yemen or in Syria. And so that's um, yeah, one way that I'm trying to apply artificial intelligence and computer vision into the human rights space is just to realign the way that the tools are developed. And it creates a lot of ripple effects if you can rethink the data infrastructure in the way that data is created. And this, to me, has, I mean, this topic of data generation, I think, really plays into 
the future that we're creating because you can't have an algorithm without data. Mm. In a way, the algorithm is how you use the data and how you look through it. So the data is so vital, so important to an algorithm that it's absolutely useless without data. And what I found in the other project, to tie them together, uh, the Megapixels project, where I trace the information supply chains that lead to face recognition, um, is that most of it is coming from us, I mean, from consumers. When you, when you click the terms of use and you agree to submit data, you're powering the global biometric analysis supply chain by providing data. And one, um, to drop it in now, maybe we can discuss it more later, to bring up a, an interesting talking point, I think, is when you look at the categories of where that data comes from, um, so a lot of it comes from arts and entertainment. There's a, a data set called YouTube 8 million or YT8M, and the top category in this massive data set that's really you know, quite, um, quite important to industry and, and research, the most populated category in this data set is arts and entertainment. And if you look at face recognition, the majority of the images are actors and actresses. Well, it's all kind of artists. So I think about the role that artists play in generating data in all the research that I've seen and realize that kind of by and large, artists have created the data unwittingly. And now is a good time to rethink artists' role as uh, taking the lead. So creating data for a specific cause rather than giving it up to um, a big tech company. So that's a very good segue to Nai, who can introduce us to the work you're doing. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I, before I kind of even talk about that, um, I think it's really um, it, it just interesting to talk about the idea of AI and what we mean when we talk about AI. Um, so, so from my perspective, I mean, the idea of like a manufactured being or an intelligence is something which has been part of our cultural narrative for centuries. Um, and in a way, it's like a kind of an empty conceptual container, like a kind of idea waiting to be enacted. Um, and recently, sort of obviously machine learning type technologies have come along and they kind of fit quite nicely into that AI container. But the power and the resonance of the notion of AI um, sort of goes far beyond the um, capabilities of these technologies. Um, and in a way, sort of blurs our understanding of its limitations. So when we talk about AI, what we're talking about is a kind of, is, is a fictive thing. So, so almost everybody has an idea of what AI is. Very few people um, could accurately tell you what machine learning is. Um, and I think this sort of um, idea of AI, it almost becomes like a kind of Trojan horse. So it sort of bestows a kind of perceived agency um, onto the technologies which can be really used to obscure the sort of economic or the political agendas of um, the people using it. So then they would say, you know, AI has taken my job. Well, of course, AI hasn't taken your job. AI doesn't have agency. AI doesn't want your job if it exists. What's happened is that your boss has found it more, um, you know, economically efficient to automate your job. Um, but I think it's, yeah, people talk so much about AI, but, you know, I always think, you know, what exactly it's important to clarify exactly what we mean. And I almost wonder if this sort of core kind of dichotomy duplicity within the concept of AI is the thing which allows it to be lent so easily to um, abusers of power, abusers of human rights and, and so forth. Yeah, so that, and the, uh, you know, not only the boss, uh, but having it as a kind of a mask, mm. 
team that's doing it. Yeah, it absolutely. It's a mask and it obscures the real intentions behind it because everybody thinks they know what AI is. Yeah. They don't see it. And so, you know, you see, you know, oh, AI has made this artwork, AI has, um, yeah, AI has taken my job. But I know this has become more and more of an excuse when you're trying to get through some consumerism mm. or something. It's the machine that's doing it. It's yeah, not that. it's that yeah. bestowed notion of agency, which when we use the word, in you know, in, in, I kind of don't believe in AI, and when we use the word AI, we are bestowing that kind of agency which helps to obfuscate what is really going on. That's right. Um, you know, so I would almost rather never use the word AI, though I have to say, I mean, I don't know if we, we were going to talk, we talked a little bit about funding when we met before, I find myself, you know, I find myself playing with the concept of what AI is. I mean, my um, project, The Seeker, which was like a machine entity that travels the world virtually and describes what it sees, and it uses machine learning. But I use the phrase a kind of proto AI to describe it because I can't quite bear to sort of have narrative that it's an AI, but also I'm kind of interested in mm. what is that idea um, of an AI. Uh, but I think when we, yeah, I, I think we need to be careful even using the word because we kind of play in to um, people who want to use it. Sorry, I. I would say too late to stop using it, but maybe <laughs> reframe it. Um, yeah, and reframe it. Whether you, Russia, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I I totally agree. I think. Um, there's there's probably no one agreed definition of, of AI and and if you get a, a, a bunch of, of technologists and um, software engineers in, in a room and ask them to define AI they'll, they'll probably come up with you know a, a ton of different definitions but I mean roughly what what AI um, describes is is a process in which you use computers to do things that traditionally re require human intelligence um, and you know, that's through algorithms, which are sequences of instructions which tell a computer what to do. Um, and they classify, analyze, and, and draw predictions from, from that data. Um, and, you know, as, as Nine and, and Adam had, have, have said already, um, in order to function, they require a huge amount of data. That's, that's really what powers um, AI. That's that's sort of the life, the lifeline, the 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 heart of of, of AI, um, and I think you know I, I completely agree that that you know we we bestow this agency to on on AI we we give it this enormous amount of trust um, which we wouldn't necessarily give other other types of technologies or other types of machines, and we also and I think this is where it gets really dangerous we we seem to think that AI is, is neutral and that AI is capable of making better decisions than, than humans. But of course, we forget, or some people forget, that AI is made by humans. It is programmed by humans. And the, the very biases that, that we're seeking to eliminate through using AI are inevitably present because it's humans that, that produce that, that technology and, and produce um, you know, reproduce the biases. And, and now that we're seeing AI is, is widespread and, you know, nearly every aspect of our lives, um, that's where the danger lies, that if, if we're not careful in the ways that we're um, governing the use of AI and the way that we're, we're training the data sets um, and the way that we're applying the AI, then it has the capability to exponentially have negative and unintended consequences on, on people's lives. But really the AI is, is, the, is the tip of, tip of the, the iceberg here. And I, and I think, you know, if, if, we, if we bring it back to data and, and the, the amount of data that's needed to, to train AIs, I think that's where it gets very, very dangerous. And, and you know, we see, we often talk about how on, on our digital spaces, on, on social media, how AI tends to, um, amplify hate, um, polarization, um, to, to, you know, um, show you ads that, that you probably don't want to see or to, to try and influence your behavior. Um, and the way that that's done is, is by creating, uh, as much data as possible on you. So when you're accessing Facebook or Google services, you're consenting, um, to, to giving away all of the, all of your very personal intimate information. 
um, as 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 a as a cost essentially. They're they're not free. Um, we're, we're paying with with our data. Um, every click that you take, every site that you visit, every interaction that you have is recorded, and that's used to create a profile about you. Um, and AI is used to analyze that data that's collected about you to create that profile, to create predictions of your behavior, which are then sold to um, anybody who wants to influence you. So advertisers, um, but it could also be political parties, as, as we saw with the with the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And, and that's that's the, the business model of, of those of, of those um, big tech organizations of, of Facebook and Google. And it's what Shoshana Zuboff terms surveillance capitalism. Um, and, you know, put simply, Amnesty believes that this is the business model is, is one of the, the most pressing and, and important human rights challenges of, of our times um, because of, of how we see that the capacity that um, the business model and, and its manifestations, its impacts um, have such far-reaching consequences on on our lives, on on the way that we access information, the way we see information, who we interact with, what we believe, who we vote for, um, the the dis spread of disinformation, the spread of hate speech online. These are all symptoms and manifestations of a deeper problem to do with the business model, which is reliant on collecting as much data as on us as possible in order to, to, to create predictions on, on our behavior. So that circles us right back to Adam and the YouTube 8 million that you were mentioning. And of course, this is being streamed to YouTube. So we're in this kind of perpetual system. Yeah. And is it too late? Is there a way? I mean, these business models have been worked on for decades now. Um, I'm a very early user of uh, internet and I could see it coming, but many just didn't. And then everybody's just caught up in it. And it seems like, how can we possibly be out of the machine? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's nothing new, I'm afraid. And it's been written about for a long time in uh, Adam Curtis movie, there's, um, I think it's all watched over by Machines of Loving Grace. Yes, I love that movie. I've watched it yeah. many times. It's amazing. And you can watch it again. And yes. you, you may notice a, um, a quote from a writer named Humdog. Mm -hmm. And Humdog was a early, it's a pseudonym, early adopter of internet technology and wrote in the 90s about the dangers of what we're still talking about today, which is that it's kind of a scam the way these technologies operate. We're, we're given a false sense of um, identity through some of the platforms. Uh, they, they suck us in, they gamify different social experiences. And this, to me, is a very historic and um, early piece of writing that said it all. And if you look back, people are still trying to say what she said over 20 years ago. And so this is a very worthwhile uh, poem uh, statement of hers to read. And what I was going to say something about AI and, and I brought up the enigmatic qualities of AI, that no one knows what it is, and I won't admit to uh, either, but I guess you could, in some ways, compare it to QAnon. And yeah, because if we called, listen, if we called this um, presentation QAnon by humanity, people would be drawn in. And there's something that is indescribable about AI that keeps people hooked as long as you can't describe it, it's enigmatic. And this allows people to come up with any type of definition for it. And there are good things and, and bad things about that. But I'll now draw this back to facial recognition as a more specific example of what I'm talking about. And I won't mention QAnon again. <laughs> OK. Well, facial recognition is something that's been in the headlines a lot. 
this year, the last few years, it's been being banned in several cities in the United States now. And facial recognition is more or less a marketing term for um, a more precise terminology that no one wants to use, which is that facial recognition is only a similarity search for visual information. And I can't say it more clearly that facial recognition does not exist. So it's only ever a probability score you get to be able to estimate whether someone looks a lot or a little like that person. And I bring up an example of when, um, say, an innovations officer at a police department talks about the face print, and they consider it like a thumbprint. And there's a big difference between the terminology used here, that a face print is not a thumbprint. A thumbprint has a definition. I think it's seven or eight minutia points. And a face doesn't have minutia points in the same way. So you have to define a face relative to different things, like the um, spectral bandwidth that you're capturing it in visible or infrared or thermal, uh, near, medium, or long range infrared. And you have to consider how many pixels and where you draw the bounding box. And none of that is considered when even people who claim to know so much about face recognition just say that term. And it's the, you know, it's that we don't know that prevents us from creating good policy about it. And the term, when you break it down, becomes boring. But humbling these technologies, I think, allows for the opportunity to create better policy around them. So as a more specific example, I, I haven't really seen any conversations about face recognition in the policy space about limiting it to a certain resolution, whether in the spectral bandwidth or in the XY uh, capture size pixel resolution. But say if you did limit the capture size, if you limited the resolution of our video on YouTube to 12 by 16, then you can't do anything with it. But it's going to be in HD, I know. And that means that there's a lot more data in it. And all you need is 100 by 100 pixels to do quite broad visual similarity search to find similar pictures of a person. So I think my, my statement here is that, um, you know, responding to what Nye said, if we can deconstruct a little bit, then I think we can make more progress in terms of figuring them out, what are the dangers and what are the opportunities as well. And it also brings to the forefront the importance of education and how to parse through all the fake news, what's real, what's not real, because now it's become so confusing for people that we don't even know. Even I have to check everything three times before I repost it or I tell somebody about the fires here, for instance. I mean, you, you just don't know. You have to check, is this somebody exaggerating? Is it meant to? All of a sudden, Antifa is being uh, uh, kind of falsely accused. Uh, and it, the whole thing is just really bizarre at this point. Uh, but to bring it back to the role of the artist holding up the mirror and the uh, way we think about it and how we can quote unquote, educate in a non-conventional way through experiences and projects. Um, Nai, do you want to talk about it a little bit from your perspective? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a kind of interesting what, um, I think, or I, I, I prefer not to, just, sorry, I'm just trying to formulate this. Um, I think it's it's important not to instrumentalize art um, so much in that you know it art has a val the value in as much as it performs some social or ideological um, function um, because you know I think art has value whether or not it, it does that um, but I think there is there is. Um, something that art can do very effectively in terms of taking ideas from one domain to another and reframing them. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think that can be a way of um, delivering new perspectives. Um, so, yeah, it's always it's a bit strange to talk about this because, you know, when I sit down, and I wouldn't want to kind of in any way generalise, but when I sit down to make a piece of work, um, I'm not making something specifically to fulfil um, some social agenda. I make something because I find an idea and it's interesting um, and I kind of fish around to try and understand what that idea looks like and I take it out and I kind of show it to the world. Um, and if it does have some kind of value in that way, then that's great, but that's that's not, what I, not, not why I'm doing it. Um, I mean, having said that, I'm a human being and a lot of things that interest me are um, around sort of um, surveillance or hidden power structures embedded within technology, um, things like that. Well, I understand not having the intent to go out and be that kind of um, educator in the sense of didactic or sitting down with that work. I don't think it would be art if you did, actually, it would have a different purpose. But nevertheless, you do bring a message and you do bring people that is very powerful in relation to AI. And if we just stay with that, just the fact that you're bringing it into the public discourse in the art form that um, has the potential, let's say, to reach a much wider audience, especially if you uh, circle back to Adam's initial comment of arts and entertainment being the biggest data uh, gathering space and how much it's being manipulated as well. I mean, even the policymakers are starting to act like arts and entertainment these days. <laughs> so it's all mixed up. And I don't mean to say, oh, art has a purpose or a role. But I do think that when you make such a strong statement that um, some comments on how you see that influencing the public would be interesting to know, like without it necessarily being the initial intent. About um... well, if you're addressing <clears throat> surveillance and capitalism and all the issues you're bringing with your artwork, um, and maybe that's not your intent, but that's what it's doing. It's actually influencing the way people are experiencing, for instance, AI or understanding surveillance. I guess that's what I'm trying to tease out of you. <laughs> yes. Um... It's certainly, you know, when I started making um, or creating the, the Seeker, it was because I was very much interested in um, teasing out a notion. Or, I mean, very interested in the sort of computer gaze and the way machines are learning to look at the world. And when I created uh, the Seeker, it was very much about trying to... Um, understand for myself what this kind of machine gaze might look like sort of in action or sort of enacted on um, a sort of visual frame. And I, I, I actually first um, began the project. Um, I've been collecting images um, taken by machines by uh, surveillance cameras. Um, and these were really interesting images which are taken not by humans, but just by uh, algorithm hitting a surveillance camera and snapping a shot of the thing that it saw. Um, and I just thought there was a very interesting kind of quality to these machine generated images. So I, I started thinking about um, what machines were starting to, you know, if machines were taking images, what kind of understanding in a way they were generating of these images. And um, um, I remember I started off um, doing, taking, running image recognition, um, Amazon, in fact, Amazon recognition over um, a series of these images I collected. Um, and I came across, um, I, I looked at the results, all the labels that it generated, and then I came across um, one particular image, um, and it was... And it, a photo of a dog on a pavement um, somewhere in Germany, um, very innocuous image. 
Um, but what the image recognition system had seen within that were warship, battleship, airplane, um, and all of these really, um, you know, very militaristic concepts in this really super innocuous picture. Um, so it was a sort of way, I guess, of understanding in a very visual way um, the sort of issues that um, you, Adam, and, and Russia have been talking about, about how these um, public, widely used systems are very much driven by, um, by military and by homeland security. And I suppose, for me, the kind of power in that was that these sort of, that this gave me a way to talk about these sort of issues, but purely in a visual way um, rather than theoretical. Way. So it would have this, had that kind of visual impact. So that, that's why I created the seeker. I thought, okay, um, let's have a look at the way you know the biggest um, public image recognition service in the world is actually seeing the world what can it see what can it not see how is it framing the things it sees what sort of language is it using um and so really that that's why i created the seeker um so just sort of trying to understand to what ex how, what sort of language was being used, what new worldview we were creating, because, you know, this sort of image recognition technology is very, very powerful and kind of, in a way, starts to define the world that we look at. Um, as computers categorise things, and that, that starts to affect our gaze. Um, yeah, so I was really... Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, moving forward... Um, Moving forward, I would actually pass it on to Vasha, who last time we talked actually uh, mentioned that Amnesty Tech actually collaborates with artists. And um, just hearing that talk, it occurs to me that what's typical is for an artist to share their individual experience that then people reflect on and understand better than if they're listening to the news or reading a paper or l reading a book, et cetera. So I imagine this becomes interesting when you're trying to deal with some pretty heavy issues as you are. Um, yeah. I would be very curious, yeah. I'm sure the audience as well. Um, Sorry, yes, yeah, so, just to fin finish that thought as I was kind of um, formulating, I think the ability, the way that um, the, our work is, is able to deliver a visceral um, rather than a kind of theoretical experience of some of these ideas, which could be sort of taken in on more of a kind of physical level. Exactly. But sorry to interrupt you because I was just, um, I just want to finish that. Oh, so I then interrupted you, sorry. <laughs> Okay, Rasha. Sorry, Rasha. No, no, absolutely fine. No, um, I mean, I, th I think I think you and you and Adam co covered a lot of the points. I mean, I think one one of the things that that we find challenging as as, as a human rights organisation and many many organisations working on on these issues is is how to make the harms of technology and the harms of artificial intelligence um, really resonate with people. How how to really show the human impact of of the technology. Because you know, as, as we discussed, AI, AI is everywhere. Um, it permeates you know nearly every aspect of our lives, but we can't see it, and and we can't. It's, it's very difficult to, to feel it. Um, you know, some people liken AI to electricity because it, it powers so so many of our of our systems. Um, so it's not it's not tangible. So one of the challenges that we face is how to communicate the human rights harms of the business model, the human rights harms of algorithmic decision making in in social welfare systems, in education, in employment, in healthcare, in whatever it may be. How to um, you know show the human rights impact uh, and the and the effect of systems like facial recognition systems, because a lot of a lot of the time um, you know people will say, well, I, I don't have anything to hide, so it doesn't matter if if a facial recognition system captures my face. But actually, there are bigger implications um, to that, and and I think that's where art is and and artists are so important in in making the intangible tangible in making people 
get that visceral reaction that you were talking about, Neve, get, getting people getting people to to feel something that they otherwise wouldn't feel, and and getting people to um, to engage with something, different audiences to engage with something that they otherwise wouldn't have have engaged with um, in the in the first place, and. You know, as as you mentioned, it holds a mirror up to society, and it, it kind of forces us to, to look at that, to look at that, and and um, you know, forces us to to realize what what are the implications of our faces actually being captured by these systems and, and stored on data, databases. Um, so I think it has a really really important role to play. It also has another role to play in actually resisting um, these types of technologies. You know, through um, some of the work that Adam's done with with um, disguising your your face so that your your face can't be captured by a facial recognition um, system, by other artists making um, sunglasses or glasses that that dazzle the the facial recognition so that uh, the cameras so that the, their faces can't be captured. Um, so I think it, it does play a, a hugely powerful role and and. As Victoria mentioned, Amnesty has partnered with with artists in in the past um, to convey the the you know the human rights issues that 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 we often um, talk about, and it's it can often be much more powerful than issuing yet yet another report or um, you know putting out a press release or, or whatever it may be. It's it's just a different way um, to reach a diverse. Uh, Diverse audiences and, and to engage with them in 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 a, in a different way and you know we do that through um, through art we do that through films so at the moment we've we've actually partnered with um, filmmakers of a, of a new documentary which is which was out last week um, on Netflix called The Social Dilemma which um, features a bunch of of um, Silicon Valley industry insiders and some of whom were the actual architects of of the business model model that that way that we. Um, feel the effects of now, uh, talking about you know how the initial promises of Silicon Valley um, has has turned into a, a nightmare, and um, that what we're seeing on social media, where, where we're seeing the worst aspects of, of humanity play out on on social media, is, be, is is a direct result of how these platforms were designed, and and the economic incentives which they drive, um, and so I think that is is a very important um narrative building tool to to actually show people um what we what we what we mean when we're talking about the human rights impacts of the business model um and how things like hate speech disinformation um online abuse um polarization uh etc manifest themselves um online as a direct result of of how the business model was was designed um, to keep keep our attention for as, as long as possible, and therefore you have algorithms which amplify um, incendiary um, material and, and 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 videos and and content in order to keep your eyeballs on the screen for as long as possible, in order to gather as much data on you as possible, in order to feed that into the algorithm, which then generates predictions about your behaviour. This kind of vicious vicious circle. Um, so all that to say that um, I feel like art has an artist have have an absolute you know critical role to to play in in raising the awareness of, of these issues and, and and getting people to care about things that they probably otherwise wouldn't have been exposed to or, or wouldn't wouldn't otherwise um, care about. You're muted, Victoria. <laughs> the usual Zoom moment. Yes. <laughs> I was just going to ask, I remember uh, when we first met, we had a really nice uh, overview of masks and how all this uh, technology, uh, facial recognition actually went out the window. But I just recently glossed over, um, admittedly not in detail, um, that there's facial recognition with masks now. So <laughs> this how did this happen so quickly? <laughs> so, well, I, I can yeah. maybe humble this technology a little bit. There are companies that claim to provide face recognition with a mask on. For example, Rank One is one of them, a US-based company who provides a lot of face recognition to government agencies, um, federal, probably state. And they claim to have what's called periocular face recognition. That if you think about it, there's no face anymore. 
it's zooming in on the region between your eyebrows and wow. just above here. So you're still calling it, again, face recognition, but it doesn't make any sense because this is not the face. And now we're doing almost iris recognition. Mm. And again, it's important to reconsider the definition and pair these terms to technical uh, meaning. For example, with the fingerprint, it has minutia, um, which are the different points um, where the lines kind of um, coalesce on your, on your finger. And with face recognition, well, if you have a high enough resolution, then you can do iris recognition, right. not periocular, or you're doing double iris recognition. But then even also with iris recognition, that then needs to be broken down further. So you have these technologies that stack up, and if you don't define them, they keep kind of multiplying on top of each other because the term face recognition is not being defined by the people who are affected by it, being defined by the industry. And in many cases, the users, not in addition to the people who are affected by it, but the users of the technology, for example, the law enforcement agency, they are not computer programmers. They're users of the system. And they read the marketing literature and think that it can do anything and everything. Mm -hmm. And in reality, um, was it, um, maybe Rasha, you know, Liberty or Big Brother in London did a study on the effectiveness of face recognition, and it was terrible. I mean, it couldn't identify anyone. That's because it's not face recognition, as I said. Um, it's just finding the person who looks the most like that person. And so many factors come into play here. Um, you look different in the morning than you do in the evening, and when you're smiling, your face recognition score changes. So the only photo that ever matches perfectly is the exact same photo of yourself. And that's not magical at all. Mm. And if I could so just... No, yeah, go ahead. No, no, sorry, sorry, Adam, finish your point and then I'll jump in. No, no, go ahead. No, I, was, I was just going to say that it, it also just raises um, two two other issues which, which, which I think um, are really interesting, which is... Um, one of the one of the points that Adam just raised about how effective these tools are, um, and the fact that um, these systems are often developed by um, a privileged handful of um, predominantly white companies based in Silicon Valley, um, and therefore, you know, uh, many studies have shown, um, for example, by the ACLU, by um, the Algorithmic um, Justice League. Um, that facial recognition technologies uh, are woefully bad at um, detecting the faces of people of color, um, and particularly women of, of, of color, because these systems have, haven't been developed with those people in mind, with their skin tones in mind, with those, you know, it's, it's often um, a, a handful of, of um, privileged um, companies that are developing these systems which don't actually work in, in the real world. And the second point is that, you know, irrespective of how accurate they are, I don't think we can evade the um, reality that they're essentially tools of mass surveillance because they are designed to pick up every and uh, every face wherever wherever the camera pans um, which, whichever face it picks up without an individualized suspicion of, of wrongdoing um, they're just picking up all of our faces and, you know for the for the purposes of you know just in case uh, that those faces might but might be needed in the future either to incriminate or to um, you know um, go after particular people of, of, of society, usually disadvantaged and marginalized communities which are targeted using these systems. Um, and so we really need to step back um, and not uh, accept, um, you know, as, as a fait accompli the, the, the existence and, and use of these systems. Why, why are they being brought in? Um, what, what is the justification? Um, do we really need them? Uh, I think that where we forget to even challenge the existence and use of these systems and, and, and accept accept their uses is where we get into really dangerous ground because um, 
it's AI is, is the sexy thing right now and it's being introduced in, in, in very, multiple different sectors. Mm -hmm. um, and we need, really need to take a step back and ask, well, why is it being introduced? Is it needed? Um, why, is, is, why are government resources going to, to, to those technologies rather than actually um, you know, being used to, to, to tackle root causes or systemic issues in society to do with lack of police, uh, adequate police funding or, or lack of um, funding of adequate health care. And, you know, using AI to, to plug those gaps is, is a very short-sighted and, and is putting a plaster on a much deeper issue, which, which we all need as a society to, to talk about and to challenge and, and to really ask questions of our governments about why they're introducing certain technologies in, in certain areas. But not to mention the amount of energy that AI requires that actually is contributing to climate change. And there's some that say that it will help climate change and it's just mind-boggling, no. It actually does the opposite. <laughs> so it's another mask of deception and, and this kind of samsaric circle. Yeah, we can't move away from this idea, can we, that the end result of AI will be some super being that will either destroy us or save us. Um, and I think a lot of people who um, actually design these systems um, are, in many ways, they're waiting for the singularity when you know all they don't need to worry too much about these difficult problems because you know soon ai will just sort it all out for us or the other way but i'd like to also you know bring up the benefits because i'm a practitioner of leveraging these systems for what they can do and i feel like i've put myself in um stuck in the middle where one day I talk about the dangers of collecting data, and then the next day I'm using that data because I want to make algorithms too, and I want to put them to use. And I see the benefits, and so I play both roles, and this kind of forces me to sympathize a little bit with the researchers and think about how, well, there is, there are some developments for lower power chips, for example. I don't disagree, a lot of it is a huge waste of energy. And, um, you know, one, one way to think about it also is that most of AI has been developed on free data and on the surplus of data that's been posted online. And it hasn't really tried to innovate because there's been a market surplus. They haven't had to develop data in a way that's appropriate for the system. So the reason that a lot of face um, recognition data sets are biased is because they scrape it from online. For example, the Internet Movie Database is a large source of training data. But just celebrity images online in general, which are very biased, and that doesn't provide a diverse enough source of data to learn all the features that can create enough separation between the features to make an equitable facial analysis system. And it's lazy the way that AI has been developed because of this market surplus of free but poor quality data. And I think that just another perspective on this is that there hasn't been a lot of in, uh, innovation. There hasn't been enough innovation to thinking about higher quality, cleaner ways of making data. And not to plug my own project too much here, but just in terms of synthetic data. Or another example is creating the data. And I brought up the role that artists play in creating data, but just aren't aware of it. And I think that's a really interesting just um, concept to explore is how can artists create data that they can take advantage of rather than someone else. And artists are expressive people, and they can do things, they get away with things that other people can't. You can always say, I'm working on an art project, and people give you a lot of leniency. Um, so I think this is just another perspective to add to it here before we um, take too many steps in the you know, direction of fatalistic conversation. And I did want to bring up one other point, um, you know, just about the way that 
the budgets are wasted on AI that doesn't provide what it actually claims it should do is a project by a researcher who was, maybe still is at Columbia University, Laura Kurgan. It's called the Million Dollar Block. And it looks at what if you invested, what if a city invested $1 million into the community rather than waiting and spending that money on incarceration? Because the incarceration costs for one block in New York City were you know, near that figure. So why don't you be preemptive and proactive about uh, spending a budget instead of buying the shiniest new innovative toy that companies are trying to sell to you. And it's really bad. Um, well, I don't want to moralize too much here, but I think, you know, to, to boil the point down, I think the marketing language is so strong for a lot of AI uh, products that claim to have or do AI that people aren't sure exactly what it's doing and they need to impress the next person all the way down mm -hmm. and part of it is that everyone believes in ai and they want collectively to move into the future and embrace technology instead of doing the hard-nosed work of looking at this is the block that needs some community investment and that would actually save money and you wouldn't have to invest it. So there are, just to, to bring in that perspective, I guess um, it's, a, it's a specific project that I think is really interesting. And I always bring it up when talking about these kinds of things because, um, I mean, it's well thought out and it's one block, which is quite astounding also. Amazing work, really good work. I, I like your, I, um, how you framed your space being in between, where you're in between the utopia and dystopia and how to work within it, because I think we actually, all of us here, find ourselves in that place. And mm -hmm. it, it's a place that's uh, uncomfortable in many ways because you're aware and, and yet at the same time you don't want to just sit there mm. then you try to do something and you could actually get consumed by the very machine that you're trying to critique uh, or trying to make other systems with all good intent it could be repurposed for something that you don't want it to be used for so that kind of balancing is um, I'm curious how you're how the other panelists are thinking of that in-between space. It is an interesting space to be in, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, it's, uh, you framed it really nicely, Adam, but yeah, it's something I'm really conscious of myself. A lot of, um, I guess a lot of my work is quite dystopian um, in outlook, but personally, I'm kind of an optimist um, and so I kind of try and f find myself trying to balance that, um, that kind of inherent trust in the future um, with the um, with the kind of um, outcomes of my research. Um, but I think it's it's um, interesting as well to think about the really the kind of base sort of human subconscious impulses which sort of lead us here and what what we can do with it. I mean you talked Adam about the sort of police uh, the police um, organizations being seduced by the sexy um, marketing of AI and I kind of often think that a lot of this machine learning technology is almost a direct result of we started generating loads and loads of data. And when people have loads and loads of data, they want to do something with it. And it's like this way we, we keep generating data. We can't stop. We love data. We really want it. Uh, but there's too much for us to deal with. And so we um, invent all these new machine learning systems um, in order to actually do something with it. And in a way, we kind of we can't help ourselves. Um, yeah, and I don't know where that takes me on the utopian dystopian scale, um, but a lot of these um, these impulses are so kind of low level, um, you know, below I think a kind of political agenda, more to do with like a kind of basic 
human strivings in the same way that you know you kind of when you see engineers work and they want to do a thing they want to solve a problem you know they're not really thinking about the moral or political consequences they just they just can't resist solving that sexy problem um yes i get a I, I don't know that's a kind of whether I say where that placed me on the utopian dystopian scale, but um, it's interesting to think how we kind of combat these really low level sort of visceral human impulses. Mm. Yeah, I mean, just to jump in, I, I, I would probably put myself on, on the may, maybe maybe not so much in the middle, but maybe slightly leaning more towards dy dystopia because I mean, um, our our job is 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 to look look out for the human the the adverse human rights impacts of of of, a, of technologies and, and AI and machine learning systems. But having said that, you know I I very deeply believe in the in the promise of of um, AI and machine learning systems. I mean, Amnesty has used um, machine learning in in its investigations um, back in two thousand and eighteen when we were conducting I think one of the the biggest. Um, uh, uh, data studies of, of online abuse against women um, on Twitter. Um, we used machine learning to analyze, um, you know, over a million tweets um, to, to try and, and figure out the scale and the type of abuse that, that women face on, uh, on Twitter. And it allowed us to, for example, um, uh, figure out that um, if you're a woman of color, then you are you know, about 30% 30, 30 more likely to, to be targeted um, on, online with, with abuse. And if, if you're a black woman, you're even more likely to be targeted online with, with abuse. And so that was a very valuable way of, of usually using machine learning to carry out uh, analysis of a, a huge data set, which then allowed us to, to get deep insights into, um, you know, a human rights issue. That's that's a serious human rights issue online and, and to then formulate recommendations to um, to Twitter in order to, to alleviate that problem. Another another project that that we've um, used artificial intelligence for is to conduct um, a large scale analysis of satellite data to detect the destruction of human settlements in in um, in Sudan's Darfur region, um, for example. So, you know, it's it's not all bleak, and and Amnesty definitely sees the the benefits um, as well as the the pitfalls of of these um, of these technologies. I think. Um, where our um, you know concern lies is is you know if data data is such a valuable um, resource, including for amnesty investigations, you know human rights researchers rely on open source data to conduct a human rights investigations, um, you know on gathering information and and videos from from YouTube and verifying that information. You know that's that's all hugely hugely uh, valuable and and seeing. You know, if, if we didn't have access to that, especially now in, in these circumstances during coronavirus, where we can't travel um, into into the countries that we, where you know where we usually could in the past, we're, we're relying you know more and more on on, on um, open source um, data to, to conduct our investigations. Um, but I think where it's it's um, state surveillance and, and corporate surveillance and corporate capture. And, and government capture of, of, of data. Um, this is this is where our, our concern lies, and, and ensuring that people really understand what they're giving away, what they're signing away um, when when they're using certain uh, services. That they understand um, what kinds of data governments are, are gathering about them, and, and, and how that data is being used. And I think that's where human rights has a really important role to play um, in in you know ensuring that. The use of of the data is is um, respects human rights. That that governments before they they using um, AI machine learning systems are carrying out a human rights risk assessment. That companies are carrying out due diligence assessments to ensure that they're not contributing to human rights abuses around the world. Um, we need uh, legal frameworks and 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 um, AI governance to 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 really um, benefit from the promise. Of, of AI and and really reap um, the benefits of, of of some of the uses that that we all uh, make in, in in our work. I'm curious uh, how Twitter responded when you made the recommendations to them. 
Um, Twitter's been um, very responsive. Um, you know, we we obviously put put our allegations to to them um, ahead of um, publication and 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 incorporated their response. And since um, have made some positive changes actually to to the way that. Um, uh, to their reporting systems um, and providing more data on on the the nature of, of abuse on their platform and um, how they respond to to that abuse. They've clarified some of their policies around, for example, what constitutes um, abusive speech um, on their platforms, what's hate speech, and and they've given context and, and examples of, of the types of of um, of uh, uh, content that, that will be taken down or, or acted upon. Um, however, there's still more to do and actually Amnesty will be publishing a report um, on this on the 22nd of, of September. Um, uh, and you know, Twitter can be doing more in terms of its transparency around the specific categories of abuse that are prevalent on its platforms. Um, it can be doing more um, campaigns, aware, awareness raising campaigns in order to uh, make people more aware of the impact that online abuse against women or against anybody um, has um, on their mental health, um, on, on particularly women's ability to actually participate in on the online space. Our, our research showed that uh, because of the, the, the amount of abuse that women were receiving online, they often... Um, experienced a, a sort of withdrawal that they weren't able to participate online um, as they usually would because they were too scared of, of, of some of the abuse that, that they were receiving. So, you know, Twitter has made some positive um, steps, but there's there's so much more that it can be doing in order to really um, tackle this, this problem, especially around the world. I think that's where we're, we're also pushing. Um, our initial report looked at online abuse against women in, in the UK and in the US, and we did su subsequent research in Argentina and in India. And I think where there's different languages and um, uh, you know different contexts, that's where Twitter can be doing much more in order to tackle the, the problem um, and ensure that you know, it doesn't matter where you are around the world, um, you, you will still be protected um, as, as, as much as um, if you were in, in the UK or, or in the US or from an, from an English speaking um, country. So yeah, positive steps, but still much more to do. <laughs> that's, that's super interesting. I mean, do you think that as, um, that we should all actually be curbing our appetite for free software? Because I mean, in a way, these sort of issues, um, you, you know, what you know, they say, you know, if the software is free, you're the product. And um, so much of the stuff we've been talking about today, um, data collection is basically because we want free software. So we are forcing the companies who provide them, who have huge bills to pay and developers and people to pay to find other ways to um, basically leverage as as clients or um, livestock but in a way it's uh it's not just big bad companies and us perhaps you know we are complicit in this because of our endless um desire to get really sexy stuff for free you know 30 years ago we wouldn't have expected to get something like i don't know google office suite for free we'd have expected to pay for it um, and now we get it free and we expect it all free, but, um, you know, and we kind of pay the cost. But maybe we should start paying for things again. I, don't, I, don't well, I think, um, yeah, go ahead. Adam. There's a lot of good free software too. Mm, just, yeah, I, uh, I mean, there is. The, uh, terms of service, of course. Mm, right. You know, all the way from Linux to graphics editing programs can be a um, multimedia editing studio running on mostly free software. But I know what you mean uh, when you say that um, we're the product. And that's because there is a lack of guidance in the market and people have no idea. But Rasha, what you said suggests that the companies lack guidance and the users or consumers or citizens also lack guidance. And I think maybe you could say that everyone is lacking guidance about how to move forward with these new technologies and what risks and opportunities they have. 
And one one strategy that I mean I think about sometimes is the whole thing moves too fast for any meaningful discussions to happen. Uh, everyone is racing to get their product out there first and uh, beat their competitor, and then you know bring in and. As uh, an American now living in Europe, I noticed there's a much different pace of the introduction of technology here and the openness um, period before it's really spread, th you know, ubiquitously through society where people have an opportunity to discuss it and decide. And I don't, I don't know why there isn't more of that, but I guess it's because there markets don't allow for it and there's no space in certain countries i would say in the u.s and less so in europe but probably not much at all in china i don't think that there's a democratic uh opportunity for people to voice their concerns about technology <laughs> in a communist country so that's maybe something you know on the like humbling, technical, boring side is to introduce a certain period where technology has to be vetted by people who can offer guidance on it. Because it just strikes me as the unifying thing and what we're all talking about and everyone is lacking and wants. I do a lot of research on researchers for the megapixels project I mentioned. And the um, takeaway from reading uh, hundreds of research papers about facial analysis is that researchers don't know exactly whether what they're doing is um, ethical. They're simply following the previous research papers. And if that's okay, then it's probably okay. So it's like case law in the United States. When one paper is okay, it sets a precedent and then it's okay for the next person. And well, with this project, Megapixels, I'm trying to provide, um, you know, deconstruct the data sets and provide some of the context and remind people that these are not data sets, they're people in the photos. And often there are photos of families at the dinner table. And when you get really into the low level detail, it's pretty um, wrong. <laughs> Again, I don't want to be moralizing, but I think there's clearly an asymmetry about the people who are, that have their data used for many purposes that the researchers don't really consider that there's a person involved anymore. And that um, to bring it back to the title of our topic, that the AI has become disconnected from humanity. People just want AI because it's so attractive and so marketable right now. But they forget that these two things need to be connected. I guess that's what the panel is about, trying to connect them more. So to bring it to that, I have a question for the panel. When there's a big fire here, or uh, let's say Fukushima, or earthquake, or all kinds of different disasters, the first thing that goes is electricity. And with that, all the systems go down. Uh, do you do you have any idea of how AI plays into that humanity issue that we're facing more and more with, you know, just natural disasters, whether they're human made or not? Um, the fact that so many kids, for instance, are so used to just having the phone and having their data that way and not even being able to read a map. Um, how does that impact our human condition? Yeah, maybe I can I can jump in and and, and also um, talk a bit about um, Nai's question before um, about you know should should we pay for these services? And of course we pay with our data, but should we financially pay for these services? Um, I mean, this this comes up um, quite often, and I think that if if we were to pay, then that would that would be quite dangerous because it would then create a sort of hierarchy of of, of you know protection. In order to to have your privacy protected, you need to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Some people won't be able to pay for that because some people can't can't afford it. 
Um, and and so therefore, it, it, it may work out that those who are privileged and those who can pay will be protected, but those who can't have to have, have their, their data mined. The other issue is the dominance of these platforms, right? So this comes to your question, Victoria, you know, we, we can't, I can't read a map. I mean, if, if you, I, I don't know how I would cope if I didn't have Google Maps, basically, my sense of direction is absolutely atrocious. Um, but you can't escape Facebook or, or Google services, right? You know, if even if you're not on Facebook, you're probably on Instagram or you use WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook. You use we use Google Search, we use YouTube. Um, if, you, if you don't, if you by a miracle don't use Google Search or, or YouTube, then um, you might have an Android phone, which is again operated by by Google, or you use the Chrome browser. So it's the, the dominance that that they have acquired. Um, is such that privacy respecting alternatives have a very hard time of emerging um, because they're, they're drowned out because everybody relies one way or another on, on Google or, or Facebook services. You know, in some, in some parts of the world, Facebook is the internet. You can't access the internet without going through. Facebook is known as, as the internet. Um, and so it's created this, this false choice um, that, you know, either we submit to, to, to this um, constant surveillance that so either we give away our data or we can't access those, those services. And that's not a legitimate choice because of the, the, the huge dominance that these companies have acquired, which means that you know, they, they control the gateways to the digital world for us. They set, they set the terms in which we interact online, in which we access services online. And it's not just about the online world, it's also about you know, some people might have an Alexa at home or, um, or, or other, other devices that also, you know, c collect, collect that, that data. Um, and so the business model wasn't always this way. And we mustn't forget that, you know, year, years ago, um, a decade ago, this, this wasn't the prevalent business model. It was, and again, this, this is something that the, the film, The Social Dilemma really, really shows, um, because I think one, one of the architects of the business model, the ad, ad based business model of Facebook features in the film. Um, and that, that was a very deliberate choice because the, the companies realized that they had all of this data and, you know, they could they could monetize it and they could make a, a shit ton of money out of it. Um, and that's how they that's how they got to the size that, that they are at now. And that's how they managed to get all of that dominance. But you know, make no mistake, if if the business model changed, Facebook and Google would still make a lot of money. Um, they just wouldn't make as as much money as as they are now. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's not it's not that um, we you know we should ban those services or we should we should ban target um, we should ban online advertising. It's just that you know people need to understand better and be able to control better the ways in which their data is being used because it's not just about ads. We've seen that we've seen that it's not just about which kind of ads are targeted against you. It's it's about the way in which um, that targeting can influence your very thoughts, your very behavior, your opinions, who you vote for. It can be used to, sp to spread online, um, you know, hate, hate speech on, online. It, we saw the devastating consequences of, of um, incitement of violence in Myanmar, how that manifested offline. Um, so it's, we, this, the system is broken and it needs to be fixed and it can be fixed. It's just that um, the, the, the current model has given us so much convenience and we're, we're so reliant on it that we, we struggle to see a way out, but there is a way out. Um, and it's, it will take time and it, it, it will take, um, lots of different things, data protection, government regulation. Um, there are discussions about, um, you know, breaking up big tech, um, all of those things could 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 result in in a, in, a, in a fundamental and radical overhauling of, of the business model. It will take a, a combination of of, of, of um, structural solutions to, to really um, get at the heart of the model. And um, if we don't tackle the model, we will keep seeing this this type of abuse and mis and disinformation and hate speech and polarization manifest itself online because that that's what the algorithms are. Up, are privileging and and surfacing in order to keep people on the platforms for as long as possible. So we really need to get to the root causes, um, and and we can't just keep skimming the surface because um, otherwise we will keep seeing these things play out online. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think I'll second what Rasha said and the importance of um, deconstructing these algorithms and figuring out uh, what drives them and how we feed them and how that increases their velocity. And I think, you know, sometimes the companies don't know and we use them and, and we use them in a way that's kind of like programming. You know, the way that we use Twitter, we're, of course, putting text into it and we're talking to each other, we're being social. So we call it social media, but it's also a type of computational media. Because when you post a message, you know what you're doing. You know that a message is going to cause a certain reaction, whether it's to incite hate or to affect someone's emotions. You know what you're doing when you put that message in. So I think another way to consider these platforms is that we're using them as, as scientists, as um, forensic analysts. We're collecting data. We're studying it. You know, we're our own research um, facility in the way that we use these platforms to study, to understand the world, and then to take action virtually, but to program other people through it. And I think that's, of course, can be ruthless to other people because you turn them into characters in a video game or in a virtual world. And I, maybe it helps to you know, change the terminology, I brought that up before, uh, with social media and to come to terms with ourselves that we are also players in this game and that we um, take part, whether we like to admit it or not, in programming other people. When you post a selfie, you do it because you know a selfie is um, a way to get attention and that it has the highest response. There have been studies about the best thing to post to get um, likes or to receive, you know, uh, reciprocated activity on one of these platforms is through a facial photo. So we know what we're doing when we interact with these platforms. And I think we have to acknowledge our role a little bit more um, rather than only trying to, you know, look at the problem that some people are creating by inciting hate and acknowledge that collectively we're all using it in a way that we know is beneficial, whether it's for promotion, but we understand through the larger companies, the way that they act, we validate their models through the success of their business. And when um, Facebook has a successful business model, we'll copy that. And when media companies are successful in creating click-throughs with whether it's race baiting or very, um, you know, eye-catching headlines, we model that behavior and we copy it and then we redo it back onto other people. So we, I think we have to acknowledge that we are also taking part in programming people to some degree. Like we also A-B test on, on Twitter or Facebook. We post messages and we learn through the interactions we have with other people, what types of things um, get a, you know, elicit a response from other people and annoy them or get them excited or receive um, affection from them. So the point of what I'm saying here is I think that we should all acknowledge to some degree our complicitness that it's not only the big companies that are uh, using it in this way, but that we've um, copied what works well within this system and use it to the best of our abilities to do what we think, you know, the way that we like to see the world. I think that's a really interesting way to talk about the idea of programming other people. Um, and I think we also need to be kind of quite rigorous with ourselves in unpicking which of our behaviors are our own instinct, our own behaviors, and which of our behaviors have been triggered by the kind of gamified nature of the um, the applications that we're using. Like you were talking, Rasha, about you know how you can't read a map now because you have to use Google Maps. Um, I, I used to um, do some work in gamification, and you know just understanding the sheer um, 
the way that the sort of psychological tool set was used to so precisely uh, manipulate all our, our subconscious behaviors and the effect of that kind of uh, feedback loop that we get from uh, social media, the sort of the need that it built, the need that it instills in us. Um, you know, just the sort of really precise things like the sort of exact red colour of the little flashing um, shield that tells us we've got notifications and just th those sort of um, um, constant validate desires for validation that these um, social media systems create. Um, but, you know, a lot of these behaviours and ways of seeing ourselves in the outside world are being enacted on us by exactly the kind of um, algorithmic behavior and business models of the software systems. But I think it, and it's very easy just to lump it all in together with the way you behave as a person. But I think we need to um, really forensically understand our motivations here and which ones are being externally um, placed on us. And also, I think this is something really important to um, that we should be teaching in schools. You know, so our, our children should be learning to um, precisely unpick where they're being manipulated and controlled and understand that, you know, and that, that is a thing that could be done. Yes. Um, but I think it, it, it's really, it, yeah, it, it would be a really important thing to do. Absolutely, I agree 100% that critical thinking, especially for young children, to be learning the language of this manipulation and how they're part of the manipulation and part of the system is also fun and it can be done in interesting ways and make them smarter about what is going on. And because of the shift in culture happening so quickly, I think we missed out a little bit on that, but it's certainly not too late. Um, well. We're running out of time, and uh, the, the time we have, we have about 10 minutes. I would like to invite you to make a closing statement based on what we're talking about, and in particular about our physicality and our lives and realities we, we're in. Um, in relation to all the issues we're talking about and the fact that we're implicated. So it's nothing that we can come out of, uh, but being in it, how it um, circulates within your work and your thinking and where you want to go with it and kind of uh, wrap up this conversation. So we start with Adam. Um. Uh, closing statement. Um, I mean, to bring this back to something being discussed before, the role of an artist or the responsibility, I always find this a strange question because I don't think people want to be an artist because they want more responsibility. So I'm not sure if there's, say, <laughs> understood or agreed upon responsibility to being an artist. But I do think artists have a responsibility because they have um, opportunities and you know, they can engage with the world in a way that a lot of other people can't. Um, that comes from, for example, not having a full-time job or not being beholden to, say, the academic system. And there are a lot of freedoms so I think you know, with those freedoms, there are some responsibilities. And um, something that was brought up before is that artists are often instrumentalized. And I realized this a lot when I lived in New York. It was very acute. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, people would talk about the artist as an advertiser. And they forgot that, well, it's a much different idea of an artist in, in Europe, I think, uh, in a good way. And I think that artists do have a responsibility to kind of instrumentalize themselves towards uh, what they think is um, the, best, the best outcome or the best uh, uh, way, <laughs> the best instrument 
And I liked thinking of myself as an artist in that way. How can I be instrumentalized towards what I like or what I want to see? And I'm happy when that happens. So I think about art sometimes as the aesthetics of instru instrumentalization, that as an artist, you have to expect it, that people will want to instrumentalize you. And you can look for those opportunities um, with partners like Amnesty, for example, be happy to be instrumentalized by. And within that instru instrumentalization, there are a lot of opportunities to create aesthetic experiences and to still be an artist. So I think the, you know, when I've since moved to Europe, people have told me that the role of an artist is to be a mirror back onto society and to reflect things back. But I think it goes further than that, that the artist has a uh, responsibility to take risks and, and go places just because they can and to uh, figure things out and fail along the way. So Thank you. maybe I'll leave it there if that's enough of a closing statement. Thank you so much. Uh, we have about two minutes each if you could uh, honor that because they have a very tight schedule with the Arts Electronica. So Russia? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, Maybe I'll end it on a more positive note. I think um, it's it is it's um, easy to get caught up in the in the doom and, and gloom of of the tech, um, but it's it's really important to actually remember the really positive impacts and and potential of of the tech itself. So allowing allowing people to connect, allowing people to uh, interact all around the world, allowing. Um, uh, you know, the movements to emerge, um, campaigners to find each other, to, um, you know, campaign online, to, to set up communities, et cetera. And it's precisely because of the, the promise and, and the positive um, impact and the importance of the technology for human rights that we need to ensure that the infrastructure is first and foremost serving the people and not serving the, the business model or, or corporate interests. And so, I'll end by saying that there is um, there is cause to be op optimistic um, in this space. I think, you know, um, the fact that the the issue of of surveillance capitalism, the issue of of the business model, is is so widespread um, over the past, particularly over the past couple of years, that um, companies are being questioned, and and um, we've seen a series of antitrust investigations in the U.S. and in the in Australia and in, in the EU. Um, and we're seeing different groups rise up, not just traditional privacy groups or digital rights groups, but civil rights groups rise up and, and challenge the power of big tech. Uh, for example, um, uh, in, in, in the US, the Stop Hate for Profit campaign, which was challenging um, racism on, online or, or, or um, the spread of, of, of uh, racist abuse online. You have consumer rights groups challenging um, ad technology like the New Norwegian Consumer Council. You have, again, as I mentioned, competition authorities. You have strategic litigations by groups, uh, including Ma Max Schrems group, um, doing really you know, trailblazing work, trying to, to um, you know, hold corporates and uh, governments to account. Um, and you have, you know, local level campaigning and activism, like, for example, we saw in, in Toronto blocking Alphabet's um, Sidewalks Toronto initiative, um, which Shoshana Zuboff termed the new frontier of surveillance capitalism. Um, so you do have these diverse sets of, of, of groups and forces um, standing up, demanding their rights, demanding that the, that the technologies that exist and, and the internet model uh, first, first and foremost serves them, serves society, um, and works for everybody. Um, so all of that to say, there's cause to be optimistic. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but um, I, I don't doubt that if we all come together to create a connected and diverse global movement that we can tackle this issue. Thank you for that nice optimistic note. <laughs> that was lovely and optimistic, wasn't it? Um, yes. Please, uh, no. <laughs> the, last, the, the, the last minute. Um, the I last mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I thought I don't fully share Adam's um, embracing of um, um, instrumentalization. Um, I do think that one of the things that art can do is we've talked a lot about complicity, is to actually um, kind of locate 
um, the viewer of a piece of work, you know very much within um, within the system that the artwork is critiquing um, and really, um, you know, um, talk about um, the, 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 our very our very close involvement. We also it's not a them and us situation. Um, so I yeah I think there's um that is a, a, a clear role that art can play and something that I do in my work myself and um, very much try to locate the viewer um, within the space, be it surveillance or um, machine learning or the machine gaze. Okay. I feel I should have a really clean ending sentence. No, that's okay. <laughs> have you got a clean ending sentence, Victoria? I think, uh, uh, the, the last uh, word you said, two words, is machine gaze. And I think that's a really nice note to end in. Uh, we're all implicated. We're all part of it. We're in the middle of utopia and dystopia. And we're trying our best. That's all we can do. <laughs> as humans and raise awareness and uh, however we can in our own ways there's no rule uh, but the more uh, we talk about it as we have here the better the more awareness there is the better and um, the machines should not be ruling us that's the bottom line <laughs> so thank you so much and uh, thank you to Ars Electronica for honoring me to host this panel, I really feel humbled by it. And I appreciate what we talked about both before and now that we've met again. Hope to stay in touch. I will actually get in touch with you about a special issue we're doing for AI and society it would have such important contributions. So thank you and give me your hands, everybody. <laughs> Adam. Bye. <laughs> That's nice. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.